Hello and welcome to this podcast. It's been a little while, but we're actually Long back time. again. Back again. <laughs> I'm Alex. I'm Andrew. Yep, and um, yeah, it's been a, a month since we lost the podcast, which, you know, it's, it's a little bit of time. Took a little time off. I mean, traveled yeah. to Europe and stuff. Yeah, been, <laughs> Andrew's been uh, globe trying a little bit. Uh, globe trying. En- enjoying his life. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Um, how How's like training and everything going? You've been training's doing been going pretty well. Yeah, I mean, I've been. Uh, Switching over to more of the aesthetic side, which I know isn't oh, really your forte, but uh, <laughs> I've been having a good time and I've uh, been seeing some good results too. Uh, you know, after Europe, I lost like, or during Europe, I suppose, I lost like 10 pounds. <laughs> True. I mean, because the diets over there are uh, a little different, a little. Uh, in, in what way? Uh, well, when I got to, I was a particular uh, Madrid. And when I got there, uh, they it was on a Sunday, and um, I was at this place where it was called the Colegio Mejor Mara, wow. and they don't serve dinner on Sunday. Do you speak Spanish? Uh, no. <laughs> I mean, I try, but no. <laughs> uh, when I got there, they don't serve dinner on Sundays, and I hadn't eaten anything for, like, I don't know, a couple hours. Right. And so I immediately went to the nearest uh, Mercado, but it was closed, and everything was closed because it was Sunday night. So I went the first night without really eating anything. Yeah. And then the second uh, day I was there, I stocked up on a bunch of canned tuna because I figured out that every uh, every food in Spain really lacks a lot of uh, protein. It doesn't seem like the... Uh, public health in Spain is exactly where the United States is, but I mean, that's not necessarily a bad thing. It's just more of a cultural thing. True. So, I mean, as far as eating and stuff goes, it wasn't my top priority while I was there anyway. True. You know, I just wanted to, like, visit enjoy and enjoy the time and just True. get some memories. And You know, I had a really good time, though, so that's, I was I mean, really glad I did that. But anyway, getting back to the point, I've been uh, really upping my diet, trying to gain back the weight I've lost, you know. But, <laughs> I mean, they say you can only gain, like, a fourth of a pound of muscle a week. Right. I don't know if you've uh, confirmed or denied that statistic, but I read that somewhere on some forum. I mean, yeah, I think it's like between something like that, but you can you can gain like a pound a week. If you're like bulking consistently, it's obviously not going to be muscle. But right. If you gain a pound a week, is it like how much of that you think is going to be muscle? I, I think I've heard it's like between half. I mean, it's basically you can gain, like, between half a pound and a pound of muscle a week. Gotcha. But, like, if you're gaining a pound of muscle a week, you're doing really well. Um, and your your diet is, like, perfectly tuned in and your right. training is, like, perfect. Right. And, you know, we don't live in a perfect world. We live in the real one. So <laughs> I think, yeah, like, a quarter of a pound a week of muscle is, yeah. is totally reasonable and probably pretty easy to attain. Yeah. So, I mean, I've been <laughs> eating a, a lot since then. And True. Uh, I think I'm, I haven't really weighed myself, but I at least feel bigger. And, you know, it's been, like you said, it's been a month since when I probably got back uh, late July. Right. Yeah, so it's been almost a month now since I've been back. And, uh, yep, getting back into it. Getting back into it. So as far as training goes, uh, it was really interesting. I just want to talk about this really quick. Uh, When I was in Spain, uh, I had the issue of running into the uh, kilograms to pounds ratio, which (laughs) I quickly tried to do some math in my head. Of course, you know, I didn't have any internet on my phone or anything while I was there, so I assumed uh, that I'd be able to calculate it. And at first, when I whipped out the uh, 50 kilo dumbbells, you know, it was a little heavier than I thought. (laughs) Because, you know, I mean, you don't really think about this kind of stuff. I mean, you coming from England and all, I'm sure you are used to it by now. But yeah. me just being the uh, the basic American I am, I just <laughs> assumed every everything surrounding the world I lived in, right? It's so ego, so yeah. egocentric of me. But it was very, uh, no, an, an eye-opening experience at that when I put on the, the plates, I think, are the same, right? When you come to the 45. Yeah, it's sort of like... In England, we have 20 kilo plates, which is like 44 pounds. Yeah, so it was pretty much the same. Those seem the same. But then when I was loading on the, uh, they don't really have like 25 pounds, do they? They have like 10 kilos. So we have like 10 kilo plates, 15 kilo plates. 15 kilo is like a 35. Okay. And then a 10 kilo is like probably around like 22. So it's not quite. um, It's like times, it's times 2.2 is the uh, the conversion. Right. Is it like 2.205 or something? Yeah, like one kilo is 2.2. Don't need to get specific about it, I suppose. Yeah, yeah, exactly. (laughs) And the weightlifting. I mean, you just got to start doing powerlifting, man, and then you have to understand how kilos work. Oh, yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Powerlifting will show you the way. I mean, I really did enjoy my time when I was powerlifting. I did it for, what, like three months, four months? Yeah, solidly. And at that time, I never saw more results than that, but... 
you know, uh, my mom started calling me fat and stuff when I got up to the two. <laughs> You're a fat powerlifter. She called me a fat powerlifter. Yeah. I mean, I was only what like two ten, yeah, around there, and you know, but so uh, just trying to like lean out and just really stuff. Yeah, like, I was like, actually planning on cutting, but I mean, when you lose ten pounds in one month, it's not necessarily uh, all oh, fat. fat. Yeah, exactly. So I'm gonna mini bulk and then mini cut, and we'll go, we'll play it by ear. I suppose. Yeah, that makes sense. I think it's a small way to like approach things. So uh, how's training been going with you in the past month? Dude, it's been, it's been up and down, to say the least. Yeah. Like, um, obviously, getting closer to nationals as every day goes by, but uh, not always, like, progressing in the way that I would like to. Um, I think my squat's been sucking a little bit recently. Like, my form has kind of gone to shit. I don't know why that is. I think just um, I've been squatting three days a week for about, like, 16-ish weeks now. And I think, obviously, that's accumulating a lot of fatigue. Even yeah. though, like, I deloaded, like, six weeks ago. Do you think overtraining could be playing a part in that? Um, not so much overtraining, more under recovering. Okay. Uh, having the next. Don't those two go in hand. Uh, yeah, basically. <laughs> um, I think like the the amount of training volume I'm accumulating is fine, but I think the amount of sleep and food I'm eating is yeah. Not enough. Like Makes over sense. summer, uh, kind of in the same way that you were having an issue with getting enough food, like uh, because of the meal plan I had, uh, because of my job, I was only eating like once a day. And like the other meal I was having was like stuff I bought from Walmart that really wasn't very like calorific or um, calorific, had like good that. macros, you know? So it was like 600 calories of chicken and rice, <laughs> but it was like a thousand milligrams of salt and oh. like, you know, like not a ton of protein. So it was just like the whole summer I was supposed to be gaining. I really wasn't. I was probably eating like 2,000 calories a day and uh, I would normally say I eat around like four to 5,000. Yeah. So it's like, it was it way is. less food. And then now like, even after that, my appetite has like decreased a lot. So I think that really fucked up my squat because I tend to be, my squat is very reliant on like how much I'm eating. Of course. Uh, my bench press is pretty, is increasing pretty steadily. Um, I think I'm just getting better at the scale of the bench press, which is cool. And then also getting a little bit stronger. Um, I'm just really trying to build back up to like where I was last year. Um, I'm, I'm kind of, I'm getting past that point now. So like I hit, I did 275 last week, which was pretty easy. And then this week I'm doing 280. And then next week it'll be 285 and like as so on and so on. So right. I'm six weeks out now. So the week before nationals, I should hit 305. That'd be nice. Um, and then that will peak me perfectly for the meet in which my third attempt is going to be 310. Um, and that's set in stone, just by the way. Like, it's, it's, <laughs> I don't care if I fail my open of my second You're attempt. You're going to do it? I'm doing 310 for my third <laughs> because I will, like, this is 300 pounds is like a lifetime bench press goal for me. Why don't you just do 315? No, because, like, that's slightly too far. 315 is three plates. You yeah. got to get it, too. I don't know. But it doesn't matter at me because it's kilo plates. So oh, it looks like, It looks like you're lifting no weight anyway, so yeah. it really doesn't matter. Um, so that's, like, my, my main goal is just anything over 300 I'll be super happy with. <laughs> um, but 310 is my goal because um, in, in accumulation of that and, like, my 500-pound squat goal and my 650 deadlift goal, that will be 1450, and then that would be, like, Actually, I don't think that's 1450. I can't even math, but it's something over 1400. <laughs> what did you say it was? 1450. No, what, what was the total again? 650, 650 500, 50, so that's 11. 1150, yeah. Plus 13, plus 310, which is like uh, 1460. 1460 okay, yeah. so it's pretty close. Yeah. So, like, <laughs> you can basically, math. my goal is to get like 1400 at this meet. Uh, that'll be a lifetime PR for me, uh, even though I'm moving up a weight class. That'll be super, super awesome. Um, and then, like, the last component of it is the uh, triple bodyweight deadlift. What is it? Um, so that'll be I have to my goal is to deadlift 650 um, so depending on my body weight that could be triple right. body weight or just under triple body weight um, but right now it's looking like it's going to be triple body weight because um, nice. my morning weight is around 215 and I'm, I'm just not sure like even being six six just under seven weeks out now um, I'm not sure I'm going to be able to eat enough that's going to move me up to fill out the 231 right plus. so tell us about those cha the challenges you've been facing you you just barely mentioned that you were moving up a weight class yeah so uh, essentially it's, it's been like a long time coming um, I mean being 6 foot 6 it's really suboptimal to be competing in the 90 I was competing in the 93 kilo weight class for my entire first year that I was doing powerlifting um, and it's obviously like super suboptimal because being 6 foot 6 like at a normal body weight is going to be around like 180 to 190 pounds for you right? right and then you start training which is apparently an abnormal thing to do and your body weight is immediately going to um, increase a lot right and so for the past year I've been just eating at a very like moderate to low level because I was kind of fatter before so then I cut down and I got to this level where I was like 210 and then like I started eating less and less so I could get um, you know to look better and 
that ultimately just ended up me staying at that same level and I was just trying to uh, continuously get stronger while not giving myself room to grow. Right. Um, I actually wrote like a blog post about this, about um, being in a, like a weight class trap, which I think is becoming like a huge phenomenon for people. Um, they start lifting and they're like, okay, I'm gonna lift in the 83s. And their goal is like, I in five years, I wanna be a world record holder in the 83s. Mm -hmm. and that's fine, that's a great goal to have. But if you already weigh 190 pounds and you're competing at 181, sorry, I keep changing units, by the way, this is probably really <laughs> fucking confusing. Okay. But 83 kilos is 181 pounds. So if you already weigh 190 pounds, cutting down to the 181s is gonna be like super difficult for you to start with. Definitely. And then as you get stronger and keep eating more, you're gonna to want to put on more weight because you're building more muscle. Right. So there's only like a certain point you can get to um, where you're still gonna be able to build muscle and not put on weight. Um, you know, because you, you're you just eventually gonna to have to be like 3% body fat to still be at that same weight. Right, I think I, I read something about that. It's uh, talking about maxing out your frame and your potential. Right. Now they say, uh, at that your certain weight you won't be able you can only like physically and just uh it's just all possibility for you to lift this x amount of weight you're gonna just have to either gain more weight or you're just going to have to i mean no you're just gonna have to gain more weight yeah that's, yeah. that's all it comes down to because what they were talking about in the article was that if you don't gain more weight then you're literally going to plateau not just because yeah. you're training plateau or you're getting tired or whatever men mental thing you're literally just physically going to pet plateau now that also applies to the fact of your body frame uh and how much weight you can gain as a just a personality you being six six you have almost unlimited potential but someone who's like let's say you know five eight or something can only get so big yeah. before it's just he's just not going to be able to lift anymore exactly and i think that's the whole point of having weight classes is like that issue and i think people approach it in the wrong way because it's you have an advantage no matter like what your body shape is right, right. so for me as someone being 6'6 six, six, it's significantly as much as i find it difficult to gain weight it's significantly easier for me to get up to like let's say the um the 260 plus weight class than it would be for someone of like 5'6 because right. if you're 5'6 getting from like your natural body weight, which is probably gonna be like 150 pounds to 350 pounds, that's an enormous amount of weight <laughs> to put on, right? But as like someone who's 6'6", I'm already like, I have a 50 pound advantage. Right. Cause my natural body weight, like with bones and shit is probably already like 200 pounds. And then as someone with a bigger frame, I have more places that you can carry more like weight in general. So it's just gonna allow me to, you know, get bigger. And I think that's the purpose of having weight classes, but people misuse them. Um, and I, you know, I've, I'm saying that because that's what I've been doing for the last year. Yeah. I've been saying I have to compete at 93 because I want to be the strongest I can be and this is going to allow me to do it the most because people in the weight class above are lifting way more weight. But the thing, the issue with that is, is that I'm not winning national competitions at 93. Like I, I've only been in there for a year, that's fair, but at the same time, I haven't been winning like competitions like consistently or anything like that. So there really is no, I have nothing to lose by moving up a weight class. Right. I'm just allowing myself to get stronger. If in like a year's time, I'm still competing in 105 and like I've got significantly stronger to the point where I would be doing really well if I was in 93, then sure, I'll cut back down to 93 and compete in 93. But then from a long-term perspective, me putting on weight and allowing myself to grow is only gonna help me in the long term. Right. And I think that's a really, really important lesson to take away. And speaking about a long-term perspective, you were also telling me earlier about your plans for uh, Worlds next year. Yeah, so basically my goal, um, so like I said before, I'm a year into powerlifting and uh, over the past year, I've increased my total from basically having a zero total. Um, you know, my, in my first meet, like I didn't total over a thousand. I couldn't, uh, I struggled with everything. I had no idea what I was doing. And now my goal at nationals this year is to total over 1400. So that's like a pretty significant jump in a year. Absolutely. And obviously that, a lot of that is beginner games, but it's also me consistently improving in the skill. Like I mentioned before, uh, my improvements in bench press have pretty much entirely come from you getting better at the skill of bench pressing right. rather than getting stronger, which I'm also doing. But my uh, perspective is that, so my goal for next year, while I'm still a junior, it will be my last year as a junior, I think, um, I'm actually going to join the GBPF again. So like, that's the Great Britain Powerlifting Federation because I currently compete in the USAPL. I'm also going to join the USAPL. But what I'm going to do is compete in a USAPL meet and qualify for GBPF nationals, which will allow me to then go home next around next October-ish, which is when I think nationals are, and compete at nationals in the UK, which will, my goal is to win that then which will allow me to compete at the World Championships for powerlifting. Nice. Because um, obviously, like, being foreign, I can't compete in the U.S. Mm -hmm. And this year, regardless, I'm not going to have any chance to 
realistically win the competition because you know there's people that qualify with totals that are like 1600 1700 in my weight class so for me to get anywhere near that like i'm gonna have to start taking steroids <laughs> <laughs> or just like somehow put on 300 pounds of strength in the next couple months um but i think giving myself this next year to just do this meet get this experience under my belt so that when i do another nationals i'm gonna be way less nervous it's gonna be way less intimidating for me because also gbpf nationals is like on a smaller scale mm -hmm. there's less people that compete um it's less hyped up that kind of thing right um, so it's going to allow me to just go there and be in the mindset where I'm like, okay, I've done this before, I've been here, done that, I just need to get this total and win. Um, and I think that's going to be super awesome and obviously like my goal is to get to Worlds. Whether or not I'll be remotely competitive at Worlds is a completely different issue, but that's something, you know, that's a, a super long-term thing. Right. So I just think that... Like you said, it's only your first year. Yeah, so, so I think it's, it's just really important to maximize my opportunities while I'm still a junior because... When I move up into open, you know, like the world record at uh, 231 is like a, a over 700 pound squat, like an over 400 pound bench right. and like an almost 800 pound deadlift. So it's like, it's a lot to build up towards and it's going to take me a long time to get there. So I think it's just important like right now to take advantage of all the opportunities I can and just really focus within the next two years of just getting to this point where I can compete on a world level, which is obviously my goal. And uh, I mean, hopefully win, but you know, that's something to think about <laughs> on a different day, you know? Well, like, it's a lot of pressure. I'm sure you'll get there, I mean, seeing the gains you have so far. Well, I think that was a good intro. Um, what are we talking about this week? Okay, so this week we actually wanted to, it kind of links back to what I was talking about. We we're going to talk about um, body image. Okay. So, obviously, this is something that we've both dealt with a lot, I feel like. Yeah. Um, I guess I'll talk a little bit about my perspective. Sure. So, um, when I first came to school in the U.S., I was... A, a chubby kid I guess you could say like nah. I was carrying I was carrying a lot of extra weight like I had <laughs> had a muffin top you know that kind of deal um but I was like I was very into like partying and going out um as I've mentioned before but I never really was concerned with like the way it looked because um I played golf and that was like my main goal in life was to be successful in golf so it didn't, it didn't really matter the way it looked I mean you've probably seen professional golfers they don't all have like eight packs and look jack <laughs> so it wasn't like no they really, do not <laughs> yeah it was never really concerned of mine right so it was put on the side, but I think it kind of got to a point where I realized I was sacrificing a lot of things in my life just to have this temporary fun. And I was kind of sacrificing the benefits of just health in the long term by doing what I was doing. So, um, you know, I always had this really negative perspective about the way I looked. Um, and I felt really shitty about, you know, wearing certain clothes. I, would, I didn't like to wear shorts. Um, I didn't like to wear tight t-shirts, different things like that, because I felt I looked really terrible. And I definitely didn't like, you know, taking my shirt off because, especially when you come to the U.S. and Florida of all places, because every guy over the summer, they spend like the whole year preparing to look really good at the summer because <laughs> they know they're going to be at pool parties at the beach, like that kind of thing, Very right? True. So I think um, I just had such a negative stigma towards myself about that. Um, so I got into training and like kind of actually helped by you, like you were the person that got me into like really going into the gym. So that was cool. Um, and like eating healthy. So I kind of started doing that. Um, but then it, it got to a point where I became so obsessed with the way I looked, I realized I was becoming unhealthy again. Oh, really? Um, you know, I really was just trying to look really, really good, trying to be really low body fat, like, all the time. And it was just, I mean, this health, it's healthy in one way, but in another way, it's really degrading to yourself because you're like, oh, I could look better. Like, oh, I look fat today. Oh, I, you know, I don't look good today. Right. Um, there's so many things I can improve like oh my arms are too small my waist is too big and I think it's so easy to get caught up in that like vicious cycle where you tell yourself you're not good enough um and I actually that's why I'm so happy that I did find powerlifting because it's a sport that is so closely related to your health and wellness and that it allows you to have this mental and emotional release every time you go in the gym but it's also allowing you to keep yourself looking good and feeling good um, and it really contributes to a healthy lifestyle. While at the same time, like it doesn't constantly, you don't have to have 6% body fat to be a successful powerlifter. Right. Like it probably helps because you're maximizing your strength within that weight class. But at the same time, um, no one cares what you look like if you can squat 800 pounds, right? I mean, look at, um, you probably don't know who he is, but Ray Williams, um, he's an IPF world champion. He's 395 pounds, right? Wow. But he can squat 970 pounds. <laughs> so, like, you look at this guy and you're like, wow, he can squat 970 pounds. You're not saying, like, oh, he's really fat. You're like, this guy can squat 970 pounds. Right. And I think that, for me personally, that's the best thing that powerlifting um, or strength sports in general has given me because you're more concerned about the amount of weight that you can lift rather than the way you look. Right. I mean, I'll always care about the way I look. I'll always, like, 
be very focused on it. I'll never be like, oh, I'm just going to go to Popeye's and just eat, like, six chicken <laughs> crabs or whatever. But, um, no, so I think that's that's one good thing that's come from Palo. Yeah, I, I, I think it's very interesting. The It's kind of like a catch-22 when it comes to uh, body image because but a lot of times body image does get you into fitness, right? Like right. you said, it, it got you into fitness, it got me into fitness. But the issue uh, about body image and fitness when you combine the two is – a lot of times body image leads to um, these shortcuts right. and people want to just have the easiest way and they'll literally go to the gym and they'll work out for however long and then they'll go straight to the mirror and check out how they look. And if they don't see like if they don't like it, some people find that as motivation and others see it as disheartening and see it as uh, more of they, they aren't good enough to be this kind of person who is very fit or whatever. So I think a lot of issues in not only lifting and in the gym, but in society stem from body image. Now, I don't necessarily think it's bad in the context of you want to be healthier. Like if you see someone who, or see some image that you think you would like your body to look that way, I think it's an acceptable answer to say, I will strive to look that way by choosing the healthier route whenever I go. That's completely okay. But I think a lot of the issues that are associated with, you know, eating, uh, these eating disorders and steroids and just unhealthy drugs or weight loss pills or whatever you're doing yeah. uh, stem from this yearning for something that sometimes it's not even obtainable sometimes it's photoshop and sometimes you know seriously a lot of times it's photoshop uh but you know sometimes it's also just this guy has been lifting for like you know 10 years yeah no that's a fair point i think um i totally agree like i think that if you see i mean let's just say i see some guy that's like i see bradley martin on instagram right this guy is just amazingly jacked uh, I don't know whether he takes steroids or not. That's, like, none of my business. But at the end of the day, let's say that I want to look like him. That's my goal. That's completely fine. I think that it's good to have goals in mind. But it's all really about the journey. So if I decide that I'm only going to eat chicken and rice and broccoli until I look like that, that's really fucking unhealthy. And I'm probably <laughs> going to drive myself crazy in the process of, like, trying to look like this guy. If I, you know, go about it in a good way and I'm like, all right, I'm going to do if it fits your macros. Um, I'm still going to eat things that I enjoy eating. And I'm going to not make this the be-all and end-all of my life. But right. I still want to look like him. And I'm going to employ things that he does in his own life into mine. Then I think that's really help- healthy. I'm not trying to, like, show people that eat cleanly or whatever like that. But I'm just saying that it needs to not be the most important thing in your life. Like, if you want to be a bodybuilder, that should be your first priority if you want it to be. Mm-hmm. But if you just want to look like Bradley Martin and you, it, it doesn't matter to you, you don't want to compete or anything like that, then you need to make it less of a priority because it, it is less of a priority. Um, and I think it, it applies in the same to girls. Like, there's these Instagram, like, coaches or whatever, and they're like, oh, you do this, like, these bodyweight exercises, which really don't help you in any way other than you're just, like, starving your body of en- You're just losing a lot of energy when you do it. You're, like, expending a lot of energy. Um, you're making yourself sweat, different things like that. And then they're like, oh, just, you know, you have four kale smoothies a day and you only ever eat, like, chicken breast, you don't cook in oil, you just, like, dry heat it in the oven and stuff like that. Um, like, that's really, really unhealthy as well. Like, the people that are saying this is what you need to be doing should, like, really reevaluate what they're telling people to do because they're giving you a healthy and attainable goal, but at the same time they're saying this is how you get there. And it, it really isn't at all relevant um, for them to be saying that. You know, if you want to get to a goal, you need to find out how you personally can achieve it. Right. That applies to any aspect of life. Um, it's going to be unique and individual. It's not the cookie cutter, and it's not the same for everyone. Certainly I think true. that's kind of where the problem comes from. Yeah, it's definitely, I mean, going back to, like, shortcuts, I mean, people, when they when they think this stuff happens overnight, I mean, it, it yeah. truly is a journey, as you, as you put it. I mean, it's not like you and I are going out there and we have all these insane gains, but we do see results from the work we put in. Because we work hard. But another thing, yes, exactly. And what it does is, is the, that the little results I do see uh, is the uh, most motivation for the rest of my life. You know, like when I do see a little results from making myself like sweat so hard and like working way hard at whatever I'm doing, 
it, it motivates me to work harder in school True. or it motivates me to eat healthier here. And it, as long as the cycle is something that makes you feel good about yourself and it, it's just generally promoting health and wellness and not promoting the wrong things, yeah. it, it should be okay. I totally agree. I think that people sometimes, they decide that they want to have abs and they don't approach that from a holistically healthy perspective. They're like, I want to have abs in a month. I'm going to do whatever it takes. And you can probably do that, right? If you stop eating and you starve your body, in a month's time, you might lose like 20 pounds of fat and you might have abs. But at the end of that month, um, you know, you're going to have those abs, but you're probably going to lose them in a week because as soon as you start eating again, you're not going to have approached it from a healthy standpoint that allows you to be consistent right. with it. And, you know, you're also putting yourself through this emotional and physical hell to get to something that at the, in the long term, like, really isn't worth it. Like, I've had abs for, like, a year now, and it really hasn't changed my life that much. <laughs> you know, like, I like taking shirtless pictures more, but I don't look at myself in the mirror for longer. But it's really not, like... People don't just suddenly want to be your friend. Well, and, you're, and when you do these things, you're shorting yourself of what actually matters. And yeah. it's, it's, not, it's not the results that matter in the end. It's, it's, what, it's the working hard and getting there because you proved to yourself that you could do something that you said. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, you don't have to just do it just to do it. You go and you accomplish something. You feel good about yourself. And in, ge in turn, it generally promotes a good cycle in your life. That's... Honestly, that's the most accurate thing yeah. that you can say about this. I, I just think that people just enough with the magazines, enough with the fix all products yeah. and the you know the bullshit. There's no fix. Like if if you're struggling emotionally with something, like you're always gonna struggle emotionally with it. If you don't like the way your body looks now and you weigh 300 pounds, you're probably not gonna like the way your body looks when you're 200. <laughs> it gets a little bit easier. Don't get me wrong. But at the same time, if all you think about is the way that you look, then that's all you're ever going to think about. Right. You need to really just, the best thing about strength training or like just being in the gym in general is that it gives you an alternative focus than just look, than just the way you look. You start thinking about like how much you can lift and, you know, how long it's going to take you to run a mile in like five minutes and different things like that. And saying those targets is really what makes you healthier emotionally and physically, because eventually you just stop worrying about you know, the things that don't matter, like having a six pack and different things like that. And you, I think as well, like the thing that people don't consider is how the damage it has on other people in your life. Um, because if you're always like, oh, I want to have a six pack, that's my goal in six months. And that's all you care about. Then maybe, you know, you stop going out to dinner with your girlfriend. You stop going to the movies with your girlfriend because you can't eat popcorn and you can't be in an environment where you might have to eat M&Ms. And like, um, you're putting all these pressures on yourself and the people around you for absolutely no reason. Sacrifices your quality of life. Exactly. And I think, you know, if you're doing a bodybuilding show or like you're training to be in a physique show or something like that, or a photo shoot or whatever, then that's fine because you know that it's temporary. And at the end of that time, you're going to start employing back n more normal things in your life. Mm. Um, if your life goal is to have abs and you want to have them forever, then it's probably going to be a little bit more detrimental because it's never going to end. Because you're going to get to that point where you have abs and then you'd be like, well, I could have more defined abs or maybe my abs could be a bit more thicker or, you know, I want to have abs forever. So now I'm going <laughs> to only ever eat 2000 calories a day. It's just going to fuck up your life. Like that's the reality of it. Yeah. You have to approach it from a healthy standpoint. If you want to lose weight and look good for the summer, that's great. But you have to approach it from a healthy perspective and something that is attainable long term. Yeah, exactly. So when we're thinking about like what actually matters in fitness and health and strength training, what in your opinion is the healthy and best alternative for that person to think about so like what what should the goals be i just think that you know if you're just trying to get into fitness then set yourself the goal of going to the gym once a week right that's the baseline if you don't ever go to the gym you don't ever work out set yourself a goal of going to the gym once a week and then once you do that and you do it for like a few months start doing two to two times a week three times a week four times a week five times a week however many times that you want to go and it, it really it's unique to everyone like your goals are going to be unique to you i think it, it's good to say like i want to look better but just give yourself time to do it and i think it's not so much about the goal like it's fine to have a goal of having abs it's just the way that you approach it i think people just decide i want to have abs and i want them in a month and realistically, it's not healthy to do that. Like, I've done that before, and it's not really good for you in any type of way. So what, what is the best path? Something that is maintainable? Yeah, yeah, and I think that's why I'm such a huge proponent of, like, tracking your macros. I know you do it. Yeah. Um, 
because it's just it's so fucking easy like you can just eat basically whatever you want so like if you wake up in the morning you're like oh you know what i really fancy eating pancakes like you make pancakes then you put that into my fitness pal or what however you track your macros and then you're like okay now i have 50 grams of fat 100 grams of carbs and like 60 grams of protein left for the day so then you just plan the rest of your day about around eating that that um those specific macros and it's super easy because it doesn't guilt, restrict your life free. yeah exactly so like you know, what, I, what I've done in the past is, like, if I know I'm going out for dinner with my family and we're going to, like, get some barbecue food and I'm going to have some, like, a rack of ribs and fries and, like, a <laughs> milkshake, you know, like, all the calories and all that stuff, I just make sure I put that in my fitness pal. So the rest of the day I know, okay, my goals for today, 250 grams of protein. Well, the, the rack of ribs not going to have a ton of protein, so I probably need to, like, get in some protein shakes in the morning, uh, maybe eat, like, some more chicken breast, different things like that to uh, accumulate those macros that I do need and I'll be short on later in the day. It's gonna have a ton of fat, so maybe in the morning I don't have pancakes. I'll have some egg whites. So you're, you know, you're making sacrifices, temporary sacrifices, so that you can still enjoy different elements and still get to the same point that you want to go to. I think what it boils down to is really just a balance. Yeah. You know, if you can balance your priorities and your goals and everything, and you can do it in a manner by which you can maintain for a long time and you feel happy. Yeah. I mean, if you're killing yourself every day. Uh, for a sport or whatever and you're unhappy at the end of the day it's not worth it it. you know but if you can bring if you can push yourself to a point where you're working hard and you're eating right and you're doing everything but you're still happy yeah then you're doing it right you're doing it right I totally agree and I think you know the the other thing that kind of goes along with that is you know when you're in the gym is you might have the goal of having abs, but set yourself different goals. Like, say I want to bench press uh, 225. Like, that's my goal now. You know, and you have different goals that kind of help you get to the main goal, but there are also other things that you can get invested in that kind of not so much distract you, but help to keep you focused on different aspects so you're not, like, consumed with this one goal. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, because at the end of the day, once you assume, uh, once you've achieved that goal, what do you have then? You have literally nothing. If that's all you achieve, um, through working out, you've achieved nothing. You've just got to this point, and now you have. What are you What are you aiming for then, right? And I think that's the benefit of training, doing some different types of strength training or like cardiovascular training, because there's always improvement in those perspectives as well. And I think that's that's really helpful once you get to that point where you have abs, but you still can't run a mile in five minutes, right? So now you're like, okay, then this is my goal. And then there's always you need to have a goal that has constant improvement and and implemented within that. And I think that if you always just try and look better, there is never, it's never ending, but it's never ending in an unhealthy way. Right. Because like once you have 6% body fat, you're then like, I want five, I want four, I want three. Mm -hmm. And then you're like, yeah, and then it's just, that's an eating disorder and that's unhealthy and that's, you know, not a position you need to be in. So if you were given the task to train someone who was uh, overweight or obese, uh, what advice would you give to them as a start? Because obviously uh, they may not want to jump into it uh, gung-ho and True. just go all the way. So what, what's a good starting point for someone who is lacking the skills to work out at the gym but right. is also lacking the motivation to or, – or has the motivation but is lacking the, the means or know-how? I think um, it's a really good question. But initially – you know, the most, literally the most important thing you can do is surround yourself with like-minded people. It really doesn't matter whether they know anything, whether they know nothing. You know, let's say you're obese and you're trying to get to a point where you're healthy. Find someone else who has the same goals, right? They might be 200 pounds, they might be 300 pounds, they might be 500 pounds. They want to go in the same direction as you, and then you immediately have someone that's holding you accountable. Because every time you don't show up to the gym, they're going to send you a text and be like, hey, why weren't you at the gym today? Right. Right? And then the, the next most important thing is find something that you enjoy doing. And it doesn't have to be the gym, right? The gym is, we we say that because that's what we like to do. Right. So it's easy for me to go in the gym and like lift weights because I love doing it. But for some people, that is like the most daunting and fear-inspiring thing that they can possibly think of. But maybe they really, really, they like, they used to play basketball in high school, so they really like playing basketball. Right. Join like a amateur league, right? And go and play. like. If you're playing basketball twice a week and then, you know, you're trying to get better, your team's trying to get better, you're going to start practicing, you're going to start expending more calories and doing things that help you to get better at that sport. That's interesting.
interesting that you say that. Sorry to interrupt, but no, I think you're what you're getting at is uh, the most healthy things are tend to be the um, when fitness and body goals are a byproduct of what you're actually doing. Exactly. That's 100% the truth. I think that it's literally impossible to be physically happy, fit, no, physically well and mentally well if your goal is solely a product of things you don't enjoy doing. You know, I personally really don't like running on a treadmill or sitting on a stationary <laughs> bike. I don't enjoy it, but like, I used to run track in school, I used to swim in school, I used to play tennis, I used to play rugby. So like, if, let's say I was like obese now and I was trying to lose weight and I didn't like going to the gym, you know, maybe I'd just join the USF rugby team. I'd start playing rugby and then in order to be better at rugby, I'd have to start running because I need to lose that weight. I don't care that I have to run because I know it's gonna make me better at rugby. But you know what that's also doing? That's helping me lose weight. But right. I don't even think about that because all I'm thinking about is getting better at running. Exactly. In the same way that powerlifting, like I'll stand in the gym and I'll do like sets of eight on squats because I know it's helping me get stronger to squat. But I also don't realize like in that immediate moment that that's burning a shit ton of calories and that's helping me to lose weight and also build more muscle, therefore also helping me get to my body goals that I might not even be thinking about. Right. So it's just, it's really about shifting the focus and not being 100% conf uh, consumed by the way you look, like you said before, and just mm -hmm. consumed by that goal. You know, you have to just find things that distract you from the overarching goal and just give you side goals. That's a good point. There yeah. it is. It's, I mean, it's difficult, man, but at the end of the day, I, I don't think anyone has, you know, there's really no excuse to not achieve um, the things that you want, whether they might seem unbelievably difficult, like there might be someone that's listening to this that's like really obese and they want to have a six pack and you might be sitting there thinking, wow, that's like impossible. But it's only impossible because you, that's the mindset you're The walls you from. put up in your minds. I mean, exactly. exactly. If, you, if you can break through your own schema in your head, then you can just like accomplish whatever you want. I mean, it's going to take time. It's going to take effort. But what it breaks down to is mainly just keeping the right mindset in your head. Don't take the shortcuts. Don't do anything <laughs> stupid. And you can, you can tend to make yourself happier while you pursue this over arching goal of getting fit and getting healthy and getting the right body image or whatever you're trying to do, you know? True. So I think that's certainly just very important to keep in mind. Yeah. And I think that, you know, like we've, we've talked about this so many times before, it's, you really end up enjoying the journey. Yeah. You know, like the end of the day, whether or not I ever become successful in powerlifting is completely irrelevant to me now because I just love going in the gym and doing powerlifting. Exactly. And you know, like, it eventually it'll come to a point where you'll be like whether or not I ever get these abs you know what I really enjoy working hard and pushing myself to get these abs you know? <laughs> and I think that's that's awesome like that is. is true happiness and yeah. you know you really do find the things you're passionate about when you do that so it's awesome <laughs> it's true it applies to life no it really does cool well I think that's everything we have yeah. for you today I think so um, thank you so much for listening uh, make sure you check out our website www.collegestrength Dot org. Uh, check out our inst Instagram, college underscore strength. Our Twitter is college underscore strong. Uh, you can follow me on Instagram at Alex G. Uh, Andrew doesn't have an Instagram because he lives in the Stone Age. True. Um, <laughs> but yeah, definitely check out our website for updates. Um, I've been posting on the blog a lot. Um, I think Kelsey's going to start posting more recipes and different things yeah, like sure. that. Um, you can catch my training videos there. They'll be on our YouTube. Uh, which you'll probably be watching this on. <laughs> um, so definitely check us out, and we will be back again next week. Thank you for listening. All right, thanks, guys.